Our next speaker is Rob Jackson, who's hiding at the back there. I'm hoping he's going to come to It's like a sort of a film that's with music as people come up to the front. It's kind of like the, the, the big arrival. <laughs> Rob is an associate director at Bond Bryan Architects in Sheffield. He's an architect by training and has got a passion for technology and process improvement. Um, he's also a big advocate of open BIM, for something we've all been talking about. I think the word open is one of the like, words of the day, isn't it? And the aspirations <coughs> to be much more open. And he's spoken about BIM, ARCAD, interoperability, and standards at various national and international events. And he's also on Brian's BIM on Twitter. Good afternoon. Um, I'm a bit of a fraud because I am an architect and not a landscape architect, but um, I'd like to think of myself. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go now if you want. <laughs> um, I suppose uh, I'll, I'll just go through a little bit of an introduction for those who don't know. I know there's a lot of people who've seen a few of these slides before, but I just wanted to give you kind of an idea because it's quite important to understand the context of where we're coming from. So we are uh, a company of about 130 people across currently three, um, about to be a fourth office, uh, currently in Sheffield, Kent and London, about to have a Birmingham office as well. Uh, our main office is in Sheffield and our work is probably about 70% uh, education, um, everything from primary schools all the way up to higher education. So the schools particularly obviously will be um, certainly applicable to the government stuff um, but we also do uh, commercial work and we do quite a lot of work in what we call advanced manufacturing quite quite high-end um, high-end sheds is the best way to describe them but they're, they're quite nice stuff um, a little bit of timeline around our BIM journey again this is quite important in terms of the context of um, this presentation <coughs> we started 3d modeling back in 1994 we were throwing those 3d models away and doing 2d drawings um, but it was fairly advanced at the time then in 2005 we started doing BIM probably as much BIM as most people are doing now um, producing door schedules window schedules environmental analysis uh, visualizations concepts all kinds of stuff and that's been the template for most of our projects since then in 2007, um, we started exchanging models with other people. So Open BIM IFC, this is when we started. It wasn't called Open BIM back then, but it was very much around exchanging models. And at the time, fairly straightforward. No one complained. It worked lovely. Um, then we get to 2009. We got a project off a uh, signature architect. Um, fantastic set of drawings, tender set of drawings, stage E set of drawings. Looked amazing. Uh, really nice project itself. It's great. Um, only to realise that none of the drawings uh, aligned with each other, so the sections didn't match the plans, um, and this was really the last project where we realised that 2D really was not a way forward, um, certainly from our architecture point of view. 2011, um, kind, of, kind of changing point, just around when the government were announcing um, the BIM stuff, uh, this is my last project with the project architect, but we produced structure, we actually modelled the structure, we actually modelled the services, and we got con uh, main contractor interested in this particular project. Following on from that project, the same contractor, which was BAM, uh, we did Bradford College. Uh, it's its official launch day, official opening today, um, which was finished uh, at the end of last year. Um, the visualizations and the, the actual final building, not strictly necessarily BIM, but we pushed it as far as we could get and got quite a lot of deliverables out of it. Um, and a fantastic uh, project. Um, I won't talk about our landscape here, but probably tell quite a lot of stories about this one as well. Um, but we were fortunate enough to be get put on the front cover of uh, our favourite software, a piece of software, uh, other software is available, um, which has given us kind of global uh, impact this year. So it's a very, very whistle-stop tour of kind of the architecture, but there is an important thing there in that we have a long history of doing BIM. So 2000 and last year, 2014, we took a, a chap on um, who I would say could barely draw, never mind do BIM. Uh, and then we took another chap on who can, who is very, very keen to do BIM. So it's been the catalyst for trying to integrate BIM into what we do. However, we have two different routes that we need to look at. One is our internal team, and one is uh, working with external landscape consultants. Uh, in Sheffield particularly, we're mostly using external landscape consultants, and in our Kent office, we're an internal team, uh, which is about to grow as well. So really, from a, a, an internal point of view, I won't go through all of these points, but the main, the main point of this is that ev all the approach that we're developing is aligned to what we're already doing um, in, in the practice in terms of architecture. Externally, it's slightly different. Um, we probably have two main consultants that we work with at the moment. 
Um, one who I genuinely think we can make some progress with, another one perhaps not so. And like our architecture journey, we may end up changing who we work with. I think you know, that's something we've learned uh, over time, that we, we need to work with practices that want to work with us. Um, and of course, in exchanging information with other people, we need to develop standards and, and ways of doing that. So um, often forgotten about, and mentioned you know, level three, it's all very well, but um, level one starts first. So level one's pretty clear. There's some clear standards. I wrote a whole blog piece on this, if you want to find out some uh, more information about it. Um, and it starts with really boring stuff, like layers. And even tools like Revit, which don't have layers built in, do have layers when you export. So it's important to understand those things. In Archicad, they're a little bit more ingrained. But we have developed our template by ingraining these in the template with the architecture. So there's not a separate landscape template. It is one template. And in some ways, I'd like to create a separate one. But time is what it is. And in many ways, we all have to work together. So it's actually not a, a bad way for us. We also have really other boring things, like pens. Uh, pens historically have been based on rotary pens, and they still carry on to this day. Something that was before my time, but we've never moved. But um, you'll notice here that the pens, the actual list of pens, we have uh, a little letter at the front. So we have the architecture ones with A at the front, and we have landscapes. So we've integrated these into the template, and we've actually had to change that. One of the things that we will be doing with the AEC uh, standard as well is amending that slightly to incorporate some of these workflows. We have to set this structure up in order that we can create views, standard views. So our users only have to click on these views and all the settings will be formed. So we don't have to mess about um, doing that. So it's integrating the, the landscape into that. So you'll see that the architect, we also have interior design in there as well. Um, by taking those views, then we can start putting them onto drawing sheets. And from taking those drawing sheets, we can create PDFs. Again, I wrote a piece about this the other day, but basically you can drag these layout sheets over here. It will automatically create the British standard numbering uh, system on the, on the right hand side. We actually have um, two different uh, methodologies, one for putting it on a CDE, where it's just the, no uh, the name, and one where we have to put it on a server. Oops, going the wrong way. Um, we also do the same for DWGs. We're still issuing a lot of DWGs, unfortunately. I would love that we didn't have to issue DWGs to people, but still a workflow that exists. Again, fairly automated. At least as automated as you can get. We also have to print those things. Again, trying to automate that and make it sensible. And we've also built in standard keys. It's 2D not 3D, but you know, the keys are there. They're not in the model. People often shove them in the model, which really annoys me. Um, they're on a separate sort of uh, part of the, uh, in the part of the software. Again, built to BS8541. Uh, really boring things, again, like layout sheets, making sure our na naming system follows the standards. So really, the only difference is that it's L for landscape instead of A for architecture. Um, but the revisions and the, and the suitability codes are the same. And of course, from there, we can start to produce our drawings. Um, I got these yesterday. These are some of the stuff that we've been producing this year. Um, it's certainly not all BIM, um, but it's really useful to understand even really boring things, simple things, just taking keys and developing standard keys within the practice, something we've not had before. Um, some of you have had this for years, and that's fine. Um, the schedules is a really interesting one. We've worked out and worked out how to create this, and these were they were created. Some of it was created from the software, chucked into Excel and then chucked back, but I believe we can automate a lot more of this. And there's kind of various examples of some of these uh, bits of work that we've done. Some of it's put in photography on as well. But this is integrated in the model, so they are working with the architects on these projects uh, within the same model file. <coughs> Obviously, level one as well, and it's been mentioned before, sticking this stuff on a common data environment. Um, when we look at what we've got there, to me, there's not a lot of difference between what we've got to do for landscape and what we've got to do for architecture. Um, it's not in, you know, some sort of crazy thing. But I believe that we've already kind of pretty much got to this kind of <coughs> level um, in, in terms of sharing information. And when you actually look at it, uh, one of the things that I took a decision on our common data environment is we have no folders in our common data environment in terms of the shared area. So amongst all this, you've got architecture and landscape and services. Some people think, oh, that's bloody crazy. I had a consultant who said, oh, I can't find any information. Well, you've got a coding system. That you can search your own code. That is your folder. You don't need folders. There's an obsession with folders. As somebody said, you don't go and search in Google in a folder. So why would you go and put it in a CDE? Slightly different way of thinking. Um, but it, you know, level one is kind of achievable. Kind of this leads into level two, and again, I'm not going to say we're doing level two, but it's kind of the pathway, if you like, to level two. Our software already has tons of objects. Um, there's a whole library. There's loads of stuff you can search on the web. Um, obviously, manufacturers are starting to develop objects. Interesting to see where landscape sort of stuff goes, particularly, obviously, the, the soft landscape, the hard landscape, less so. It's probably the same as the architecture stuff. Um, but interestingly, in our, and this is where we often get confusion, even in the same of architecture, but 
that, ob that one object can create all kinds of different, um, with different settings, level of detail, uh, you know, what it looks like. Um, there's quite, it's not just those set of objects, however uh, many objects there are, three, six, nine, but 15 has limitless possibilities in terms of uh, the geometry side of stuff. We also have integrated a surface library in terms of materials because that's something we want to do. So again, that will evolve uh, over time. And of course, by developing just objects and um, surfaces and so on, and 3D modeling of sites, we can obviously produce very nice visualizations. Um, we're actually doing this one with Kia uh, and putting information into their BIM Extra tool, which we haven't discussed landscape at the moment, but um, it could easily be done because the process is the same. Now, whether this will play, um, there was a video where we've done um, a workflow with Lumion where the landscape architect has created a, um, a Lumion file from a SketchUp file and given us the Lumion file and put the model, we put our architecture into the Lumion file in order to create a really nice visualisation. Completely different way of workflow that we've never done before. Um, and once the team solved themselves, I didn't, I didn't get involved in that. Um, very much a visualisation workflow, but it's a nice way of sharing information. Interestingly, and again, this is part of architecture, but we've been doing site modeling for quite some time. Um, I wrote a massive blog piece about this in terms of sharing. Um, these crazy shapes are uh, meant to be bits of landscape, if you like, just to test. Some of them work fine, some of them don't work so fine. Um, and we have seen improvements in the software by reporting some of these things. Um, being able to exchange information between parties is absolutely <coughs> massively important if we're going to work with other landscape architects. Um, Obviously, uh, part of our workflow at the moment is we even split our models. The, these three models at the top actually come from the same file, but are split in terms of export. That allows <coughs> us to check different, uh, have different rule sets against it. So I'm actually in the process of thinking about how we can create landscape sets of rule sets to check our site models as well, because we can we can check those models um, with a slightly different approach. So that's very much the geometry side. Now, the information side for me is the more important and more interesting part, uh, and it's the bit I'm really kind of keen to try and integrate into our landscape approach. It's all built around open standards in much the same way our architecture is built around open standards. My, my Kobe logo is made up, by the way, um, but I did get Phil East, the man who created it, uh, <laughs> nice uh, th thumbs up at an event once, so uh, I'm, I'm going with it. Um, BCF less so at the moment, um, but the, the IFC and Kobe stuff is really important to us. Um, I'm just going to go through some elements of information. That, uh, this, it is a bit what, um, crash bang wallet this presentation, but kind of just to give you a flavour of kind of all the sort of things that we're having to think about. Um, everyone always says to me, IFC doesn't do landscape or it doesn't do civils, and they are right in terms of its element classification. It is fairly limited. I would say it's fairly limited in terms of architecture as well, actually. Um, but probably from a landscape point of view, those are what you're going to use. You're going to be losing a lot of other, that's the reality. Um, but that doesn't, mean, that doesn't mean that it's not useful, and I'll explain why in a, in a second. One of the things with that site geometry file was what we realised is that out of the box, um, site geometry is just called site geometry. It's actually made up. There isn't actually a thing called site geometry. But what that means is you get no data. So there's no data attached to that. It's literally some geometry. So we're actually creating it as other and allowing ourselves to put some data against this. Um, again, I've written a post on that to explain how that, that process works for us. Um, going back to the same list again, but from a Kobe perspective, not everything goes into Kobe. Keep seeing contractors thinking everything goes into project managers thinking everything goes into Kobe. Um, it doesn't. It's only maintainable assets. So if it's not, you don't have to do any preventive maintenance. It doesn't need to go into the Kobe file. So you're really starting to strip this list down from a Kobe perspective. Um, the other thing is what we've actually created a load of data fields. We're trying to use IFC fields wherever possible, but our tool allows us to create more fields. I would love a push building smart for some standard fields and a methodology for creating more standard fields rather than people calling them whatever, um, that will happen one day. But what we're trying to do is use our general ones wherever possible and add landscape ones. At the moment, this is my flying guess going through information that exists in the office from a landscape perspective and will evolve again in much the same way our architecture stuff has evolved. But where the limitations of an IFC classification uh, end, you get then the classification that you can use from uh, things like Uniclass. Classification reference in an IFC, there's a blog post coming on Friday on this one, um, it's actually seven pieces of information, not a single piece of information. So you have the code, you have the name of the thing, where it's come from, the version, and so on. Uh, there's actually quite a lot of information about classification systems. Uniclass 2015 uh, elements is very limited. It's not just limited for landscape, which is limited to planted elements, grass elements, and fauna elements. Uh, even architecture is very, very limited. 
Um, spaces, interestingly, I've just been trying to do a job with the least uh, in classifying stuff and found very little in terms of, it's lovely if you want to do sporting activity and uh, a bit of natural spaces, but if you want to do anything else external, the classification system in class 2015 is very limited. Um, we have products. These are pretty much the list for landscapes, so there's quite a lot of stuff in there. But we apply this piece of data and there's some more as well, so there's quite a lot of stuff in terms of classifying stuff. So although IFC is limited, we can still apply this data. Bear with me when I, I kind of ramp, come back to where I started. Um, new wheels and measurements, something we've built into our architecture stuff. I would like to build that into the landscape stuff as well. And something we're also working on is how we build our specification stuff in. So we're, whether you use um, old, I'm going to call it old, common arrangement work sections or MBS trait, which is kind of new, uh, MBS's butchered version of Uniclass 10. Um, <laughs> but from, from that, you can create um, model files, not just DWGs, but you can create IFC files, again, automated um, in terms of how we export this stuff. And what we have done, one thing that has been really good from a landscape perspective, but I will uh, get, get a massive tick, is I actually had a list of all the things they typically create on projects, really good starting point, and when they're going to produce that. Now this is actually integrated, this information is integrated into the template, but that's all driven from drawing sheets as well. So those are the drawing sheets. If we change the name on here, it's going to change on the drawing sheet and vice versa, so it's linked information, uh, very connected. We have to produce these task information delivery plans. So to bring that all back together, because it was a bit crazy, uh, geometry, whatever geometry you want to put on, and whatever information related to the different types of information, you can put to that. And using that example, uh, here's our standard set of information for a tree, for argument's sake, and here's our classification system at the, boat, the bottom, and potentially our Kobe fields as well, uh, automatically. Now these are just placeholders to be changed by others later on. Uh, some of this is automated from the geometry, if I change one of the settings, it will change its description. So I'm not saying this is perfect, and I'm certainly no landscape architect, but I think it's going in the right direction, and it needs some work with our landscape guys, at least the ones who spoke he and his people in <coughs> the study. Um, we'll get there eventually. And of course, if we put that information into the model, we can produce schedules um, from that, and we can then drive those schedules back onto the drawing sheets rather than it being an Excel workflow. So just to finish, um, we, have, we still have a long way to go. Um, we really need to test this. I had hoped by the time we got to December that this now that we would have done a bit more of this in terms of actual application. Um, as it happens, we are going to be applying this stuff in January. So you're actually getting this presentation ahead of our landscape guys, um, although we're getting a couple of slides in this. Um, but future things, you know, scheduling information, rule sets, quantities, COVID, um, if we need to do it. I believe we could do COVID uh, if we had to, we could do it on the project now. Um, have we solved everything? God, no. Um, but do I believe it can be done over time? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, you know, there's kind of, whether we've got the right tool, there are other tools available. Um, I'm prepared to try and break it first and then work out whether we need to change uh, our direction slightly. Um, and we are prepared to do that. I think because it's a very small team at the moment, um, we have a lot more flexibility. But I would like it to be a consistent journey with our architecture. So it is a very, this particular element of our implementation is very much at the beginning of a journey and certainly would try and love to speak a bit more in terms of speaking to other landscape architects about understanding which direction it needs to go. So uh, that's going to be done. Thank you. Thank you. All good BIM events, and definitely like a good thing BIM event, we're doing everything on the fly. So, yesterday, that was the right room plan. <laughs> 90 minutes ago, the room plan changed slightly. Oh, you've lost me with groups. Right, click, on, click forward slightly. Sorry. Right, so as Claire said, you've got um, two coloured um, groups on your name badges. 
one says one and one says two. So you might have one egg highways agency, two environment agency, one <coughs> landscape institute, or whatever. The first session you go to is the first session, then we have a copy break, then there's the second session. So I hope that works. If you're in an environment agency session with Karen, you're here at the front of this room. If you're in a highways agency session, you'll be at the 